Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another edition of TBR, and I'm George Binns. And tonight, I want to start a discussion series about what's going to happen in the next couple of years. And to help us understand it, Brendan Sweeney, Thank the counselor at large and future counselor at large. Well, fingers crossed. <laughs> fingers crossed, yeah, is uh, with us tonight. So there's a lot of stuff been going on the last year or so, mm -hmm. and there are some things that are still in process, uh, like the ADUs. Yep. Auxiliary, the auxiliary Accessory dwelling, dwelling, units. dwelling unit, yep. Accessory dwelling units. And uh, there's a little bit of controversy about it. It's, uh, it's a change in the character of the city. And this has been one of my themes for a couple of years now. What is the character of, of Beverly? And uh, we've gone through a bunch of changes on Rantoul Street. Mm -hmm. We almost started a bunch of changes on Cabot Street, and that got stopped. Um, the five-story building at the mm -hmm. dollar store. Uh, so how do the ADUs fit into all of this? Is What's going on? Yeah, so that's a great question, George. And I think to start with that point about what is the character of Beverly, which I've talked a lot about in both my first campaign for the city council in 2021 in my first term, and now as I'm in the campaign season again and getting back out and talking yeah. to voters, having that conversation about yeah. what's the character of Beverly. And so Beverly is certainly a unique city. We have a mix from our downtown, which is a lot more of an urban feel, uh, especially on that lower uh, corridor of Rantoul Street to neighborhoods like Beverly Farms, uh, Rileside, North Beverly, that are much more residential. Mm -hmm. uh, Beverly Farms has its own little yeah. seaside village there. Uh, so there's certainly different, Beverly feels different in the different neighborhoods. And yeah. that's one huge benefit to Beverly, I think. Um, so now, how do ADUs fit into that equation? Mm -hmm. One thing that I have heard and that we have acted on in my first term in the city council is that there is a concern that while there are certainly some benefits to be had from the revitalization on the lower corner of Rantoul Street, uh, especially given that a lot of those buildings were abandoned or older yeah. and we were able to revitalize them, yeah. made sense in that corner of the city at this period of time. That's not the model that people wanted to see spread mm. throughout the city. And I agree with them. And that's why this past spring, as a city council, we voted to lower maximum building heights by changing the zoning ordinance yeah. to five stories on Rantoul and four stories on Cabot, which I believe is of crucial importance to maintaining the historic character, yeah. the feel of Cabot Street. Even just in those two main streets, you can see a little bit of a contrast in character. Yeah. Uh, now, that being said, tying that into the ADUs, so if and I think that was the right decision for the city to make sure that, so we voted to essentially set those building heights and not replicate that level of development on the lower corridor of Rantoul across Beverly. However, there is still a need to find ways to add to our housing options and particularly our affordable housing options in Beverly mm -hmm. so that folks who are either being priced out of the city or they would like to downsize and really see no viable option to do so can yeah. stay here. And so what the proposed ADU ordinance that we are looking at would do would allow under certain circumstances, if you're a homeowner of a single family home with a detached garage or an attic or basement with extra space that you could renovate to turn into an apartment, you would be able to and rent that to someone outside of your immediate family or outside mm -hmm. of your blood relatives. So right now the ordinance allows you to make those renovations but you can only have an in-law, which is where the term yeah. in-law apartment or yeah. you know some other family member lived there. Now, is this limited to the existing building, or can you build a separate so, entity that you would turn into a rental? So you could, but there's requirements. So you have to meet um, setback requirements in any current zoning. So yeah. for residential zones, yeah. obviously, those setback requirements are much more stringent than for multifamilies, yeah. and rightfully so. You want to preserve the character of a single-family neighborhood. Um, you also couldn't have a building that was taller than the primary dwelling, and there are other requirements in terms of maximum square footage. So you and, could have a separate building, but it has to meet pretty stringent requirements. Yes, yeah. and so two big ones are it can't be over a certain height. It can't be over the height of the building or, I believe, a thousand or um, 
35 feet and a thousand, I don't think it can be over a thousand square foot. I have to double check that. Yeah, I know it can't be over 35 feet. Number going by, yeah. Um, and it also has to match the architectural character of the current building, the current dwelling. Oh, okay. And one key thing to keep in mind, so there's been a lot of concerns about this will lead to people buying properties or using their dwellings, uh, ADUs as Airbnbs, short-term rentals, yeah. and we want to avoid that as a city. So yeah. to be clear, Airbnb or other short-term rentals are already not allowed in Beverly. This ordinance, the language of the ordinance in front of us that we're reviewing makes that abundantly clear. And then even so, there is a requirement that the owner must occupy one of the two units mm -hmm. if they are to build an ADU. So I couldn't, as an investor, buy a single family home in Beverly, turn the detached garage into an apartment, and then rent out both units. I would need to be living in the single family home. Okay. And on top of it, Salem has looked at something like this. They've already implemented this uh, type of ordinance. They've only seen six new units because of some of the capital cost hurdles that it's no, not yeah. cheap to renovate your garage into an apartment. But what it does is for the folks that it makes sense in their situation to do so, they can look for that additional source of income from yeah. renting a unit like that out. And for renters in Beverly that may be priced out of Sedna and some of the newer developments, they could actually find somewhere in Beverly to rent. Yeah. So that's, I think, a good tool to add to our affordable housing stock without overdeveloping Beverly, without leading to more and more of these kind of skyscraper type buildings being yeah. built to add new housing. Yeah, so I guess there's a lot of advantages to the ADU hmm? in terms of, as you mentioned, uh, people trying to downsize and uh, you're stuck with a three bedroom, four bedroom house and it's just you and your wife, you retired, the kids moved out. So that makes sense. It also makes sense from the point of view, I think, of um, supplemental income. Mm -hmm. I can imagine there's a lot of people who, when retired, uh, they're limited to Social Security and some limited savings. Mm -hmm. So every little bit helps in those cases. But at the same time, I guess there's the concern of, as you have heard mentioned several times, how far can this go? And is this just the camel's nose under the tent? And little by little, it's going to creep into almost uh, do what you want kind of thing. So I guess it depends on uh, the city council to draw the line and say, hey, that's as far as we're willing to go. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's where you're at right now. Yeah, so that's where I think the building height maximums that we set are a good first step into saying, you know, from my vantage point, at least as a council, when I took that vote, I heard from the community that they were very, that folks across the city were concerned about overdeveloping Beverly indefinitely. Yeah. And that if we are to continue to build at the same pace that we have built in the last 10 years on Rantoul Street, that would destroy the character of Beverly. And I think there were a lot of very good points that were made that informed my decision to say, let's set what we believe are acceptable community standards on maximum building heights. But that's only one piece of the puzzle. The ADU piece is a way for us to say, okay, we've set those maximum building heights. How do we still find ways to add new housing? Looking at it from that yeah. piece of the equation. Yeah. And then another piece of the equation that I'm hoping we'll either tackle this fall or in the start of the next term are setting design standards. And that's something that we would be much more proactive in setting guidelines for what architectural requirements a building would need to yeah. adhere to. Uh, setback requirements, especially downtown. You don't want buildings built right up to the sidewalk. No, I... uh, some green space <laughs> aspects that would be required to make sure we're not turning into a concrete jungle of sorts downtown. Uh, so those type of things we're gonna be working on with the planning department in the months to come. One of the things that uh, <clears throat> irritated me about some of the buildings on Rantoul Street, the first ones going up, they had apartment windows right on the sidewalk. Mm. Um, that's a character that sh shouldn't happen. Mm. So, and that's what we're hoping to address with the design <clears throat> So standards. this idea of having like a, a five over one or a four over one yep. type of structure where the first floor is commercial and then... <clears throat> the upper floors of residential, sort of keeps that characteristic. Yes, 
And that's where, with that requirement, there would also be a need to have distinct features on the first floor as well. That yeah. would, that's something that design standards would prescribe. Yeah. So I think that would be a, an improvement. Okay. Uh, another thing that's coming up is uh, is a charter commission that has come up with a bright idea. Yes. I'm, I'm very glad you brought this up. We haven't and, been talking uh, enough about it. Supposedly it's going to be on the, uh, the ballot in mm -hmm. November. But what's going to be on it? What's, when do we see what the Charter Commission has recommended or what the, the state has approved. So, yeah, that's, that's the last thing you said there is the key, what the state has approved. And that's been a challenge throughout the process, and I'll walk through it. But it's something we were just talking about at our last city council meeting. So there was a Charter Commission, and this is, per the terms of the Charter, every 10 years. There yeah. needs to be a commission assembled to look at the Charter and potentially recommend changes. They started in 2020. The pandemic derailed the work. Ultimately, the committee reformed in 2021 and made recommendations to us as a city council in yep. 2022. Some of those recommendations were technical in nature, cleaning up language to modernize the charter. Yep. Um, some were substantive, but won't ultimately require any sort of ballot vote or direct citizen input in that sense. There were public hearings, and obviously folks mm. had the chance to give their input. Uh, but ultimately, there were really two big changes. Three will be on the ballot, but of those three, there are two that really would impact how our city is governed. The first is moving from a two-year mayoral term, which we have currently, mm -hmm. to a four-year mayoral term. And the second big change would be going from a seven-member school committee, which we have currently yeah. with the mayor and six ward school committee members, to a nine-member school committee that would be those same seven plus two almost quasi at large yeah. members where one would represent wards one, two, and three, and the other would represent wards four, five, and six. And the third one, which is a little more of a technical one, uh, pertains to the situation with former counselor uh, John Frades, who moved out of his ward, and because he did so, he was no longer able to complete his term. Yeah. What this question would ask the voters is, do you want to allow somebody in that situation where if they stay within Beverly, you know, move from Beverly Farms to downtown, yeah. and they have a year left in their term, can they finish their term, but then they would not be able to run for re-election if they didn't live in the ward. Basically just to make sure that the council didn't either have to appoint the next top vote getter yeah. or pick somebody. Yeah. Um, so those three questions, I am 95% sure will be on the ballot. And here's why I say that. So we as a city council had to vote on these proposals, yeah. in which we did to recommend to the, because it's a home rule petition, to the state legislature yeah. to pass these changes at the state level that we have approved at the local level. Yeah. Council voted, the mayor signed off in favor, so then the home rule petition went to the state house. And that's where I've been in contact with Representative Paracella and Senator Lovely to make sure that we have continued to push the ball forward because with their summer recess, there wasn't much activity on Beacon Hill after the end of July. September rolls around. Now we're at the situation where the House has passed it. The Senate, my understanding is, will pass it, if they have not already, in the next day or two. Yeah. And then the governor needs to sign off. Once the governor signs off, assuming that it passes the Senate yeah. and the, go uh, the governor signs off, then these questions will be confirmed to be on the ballot for November. And that's when we'll hopefully be able to do a little more proactive outreach. But that's really the, it appears that the questions are headed to the ballot. There is no certainty until okay. the Senate votes and the governor so signs off. So technically there's going to be three separate questions. Each yep. one will be voted on yes. independently. Yes. And right now, technically, we don't have any approval, but it looks like it's going to happen in time. Yes. And that's what's been frustrating for me is especially those first two. Those are pretty big changes to how we govern our city here in Beverly. Yeah. And at this point, we are about a month and a half out from the November 7th election day. Yeah. And unless you have been tuning in to our city council meetings, which hopefully you know the folks watching at home have, but understandably many have not, um, they wouldn't have heard about these pretty big ballot questions that they're yeah. going to be voting on in November. Yeah. And uh, I think we should have a separate discussion on those when they yes. come down. Because uh, the first two, personally, I think should be voted down, but that's another long story. Well, that's where we need folks having that yeah. conversation. And uh, so that's going to happen then. So I, I guess the 
Next third question, I guess, has uh, been kicked around several times. Mm -hmm. Whether we should really have a mayor or should we have a city manager? And uh, your day job is uh, assistant city manager? Assistant town administrator and finance director for oh, the town of Boxford. Town of Boxford. So uh, from your perspective, how does it that work or how does it work compared to what we have in Beverly, which is a strong mayor, relatively weak city council? Yeah, so um, as you mentioned, I have experience both in my job in Boxford, uh, but also I worked in state government for a number of years. And when I was there, I managed the COVID pandemic relief program that we were running from the state level to fund response efforts at the local level across the state. Yeah. So I worked with mayors and city managers and town managers and yeah. got to kind of see how those forms of government reacted in an emergency. Yeah. Uh, and I also worked for the town manager in Reading at the start of my career. So a little bit, I've gotten to see kind of, and obviously now in my time on the city council, from different vantage points, I've got to see the different forms of government. Um, I've been involved with the International City and County Managers Association in the past. They're a national organization, well, international, but primarily focused in the United States that pro promotes the council manager form of government. Mm -hmm. Uh, what that is, is there is a city council that, similar to what is in place in Beverly, uh, controls the legislative process. But rather than electing an independent chief executive, the council appoints a manager to function as more so a chief administrative officer, uh, mm -hmm. less in, of an executive empowered by the voters like we have here in Beverly. Um, <coughs> but the idea is that that person would be apolitical. They would be hired on the basis of their managerial qualifications and they would operate under the purview of the city council as opposed to directly operating on behalf of the voters and being subject to the whim of the voters. Yes. Uh, so the benefits of that system are that you get somebody who, while there is certainly a blurred line in terms of the apolitical aspect of manager, yeah. uh, management and politics, uh, you get somebody that ostensibly is removed from the political process and political whims and ma are ma is making decisions based on what is the best business decision yeah. for the future of the city. Uh, the challenge is that person is still subject to the politics on the city council who the oh, bosses yeah. of the manager are the yeah. councilors, um, and there is less <laughs> centralized political leadership. And so whether or not you really view that as a benefit or a con in uh, our form of government, that's a big difference. Where here in Beverly, with a strong mayor, anybody can run and anybody can win. Yeah. But you're over 18. Um, so you may not be, you could be the most popular person in Beverly and be elected mayor and have no managerial qualifications. Yeah. And you're the CEO of a $160 million business. Yeah, this is a big business to run the city yes. this size. And uh, I think that's one of the concerns is, um, are some of these decisions really the best financial decisions for the city? Um, there's a couple that have been going down recently uh, the whole issue about the ADU is one of them. Uh, also, uh, how, we, how we've been developing Rantoul Street, mm -hmm. uh, is that the best financial decision for the city? What are the implications of that for the school committee, uh, the schooling? Um, the other big issue that I keep hearing about is uh, traffic is almost impossible. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, I've noticed it a couple of times trying to go out Route 62 or come back on Route 62. The traffic gets backed up all the way into the city or it gets backed up on 128, trying to get off onto 62. Coming down Brimble Avenue, a train uh, pulls into the station in Montserrat and by the time it leaves, there's enough traffic backed up. Yeah, I've experienced you know, that before. So um, there is an issue of is this the right thing to do for the city? Can we really handle this additional housing that we need? And if we do, is it a, just a, a very narrowly focused entity? We'll build another five by uh, five over one in, on uh, Rantoul Street. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, everybody's going to take the train. Well, it doesn't work that way. So it's this kind of decision process that I don't think is really spelled out to the, the citizens. Well, let me, let me tie that quickly back to the, the manager versus the mayor. So that's where 
the mayor, as an elected official, has the ability to really drive forward initiatives such as setting the agenda in terms of whether or not to add more housing and how to do it, how to change zoning. You know, that proposal came from the mayor's office that yeah. we voted on. In a manager form of government, the manager would not be leading on any of those policy initiatives. The council would have to lead. And that's yeah. where if you have a nine or seven or five or however many member council, you may have different views politically on what the best path forward is for the future of the city in terms of policy. Yeah. So that's the one benefit where hopefully you have a candidate running for mayor with managerial experience, yeah. but they're able to lead on policy much more so than a city manager could. Now, that being said, in both forms of government, you're going to fail, regardless of whether you have a manager or a mayor, if there's a lack of communication and if yeah. there's a lack of citizen input. And that's where I've tried to make sure that I've been receptive to both making myself available to folks and then just trying to bring the concerns that I hear to the conversation at the city council. Yeah. Because if people don't feel like either their voices are heard or that they don't have access in general to participating in city government, that's where things really become problematic. And as decision makers, both as counselors and the mayor, uh, it's really important that we are communicating why we are making certain decisions, yeah. outlining the pros and cons, and then truly being receptive to feedback where if we're hearing from folks that they don't like the direction we're going, we need to be willing to change that direction. Yeah, and I think that's one of the issues that uh, at least one of the candidates for mayor is running on is uh, the lack of transparency in uh, why are we doing certain things. Uh, the one that got me riled up a bit was when you think about the renovations that are coming down for City Hall. Mm -hmm. um, if I look at all the numbers that have been th thrown around, and I'm not sure they all fit together. Yeah, I brought some numbers just in case but, we were uh, talking about this. You add up all the bits and pieces, and it's $34.5 million that are tied into this renovation process. Well, let me just, so I know what you're referring to. Yeah. I did watch the interview you did with yeah. Jim Madonna. And at who the I've same had. time, um, we got a, a city hall that is about 20, 23,000 square feet of space. And uh, it's valued at something about two and a half million dollars. And we're going to pour 25 million directly into that building. And because of some of the machinations going around mm -hmm. on how to arrange this over a couple of years, um, there's another uh, almost uh, $10 million that get floated around. And uh, maybe that's the right decision. But from my perspective, I would like to know a lot more details of exactly what are we doing and why are we doing it. And um, even watching city council meetings, you don't get this background of why are we doing it and why is this the right way to go? It's just, here it is, and uh, are you in favor or not? Mm -hmm. No, I think there's, that's certainly a valid complaint. And that's a concern that I've had in some of the scenarios that we've found ourselves in as counselors voting on projects that we may not have as much information as we need to really make an informed decision. Yeah. So I think on City Hall, you are certainly correct in that we should be asking whether or not it's worth it to make a repair of this magnitude. But I do want to just make clear. So the cost, to this point, the city council has put forward $1.5 million for design, yep. which seems pretty steep, but it involves more than just the design aspect yeah. alone. Yeah. And that's where we've worked with an architect who has presented kind of these different scenarios of what we could do to renovate City Hall. A big part of the reason of why the renovation is so expensive is because it's a historic building. As a city, we made a commitment to preserve yeah. the building in some form. So we can't just knock it down and build a new city hall on that same property. Yeah, yeah we now, got to get into that with uh, Briscoe. Yes. And that's another yes. example of we've got a historic building that has to be maintained. And that's part of the game. I understand that. But that's so this is where, with that being established, I think most people agree on that. Now it's a situation where and this is, I think, important to note, across, and I see this in my day job in Boxford, across this commonwealth, if you're trying to build a building or any sort of municipal infrastructure project or otherwise, the cost to do so has gone up significantly. Mm -hmm. When we first 
authorized that $1.5 million for design, it was anticipated that the building renovations would cost $12 million. That wasn't that long ago. That was in March of 2022. Now we're being told that the building project is going to cost $25 million. Yeah. Now, I want to be clear. The only thing the city council has voted on is the $1.5 million yeah. for design. That, hu- that price tag is essentially doubled, the 12 to $25 million. That's a concern to me. Yeah. So I anticipate as we go through the process, I am going to be asking, where are we in terms of the price tag? What about these different options? What is, what is the price difference in these options? Well, that, and then what does the city really need? in terms of a new city hall, so yeah. that we're not wasting money yeah. to build the most you know, grand structure that we can yeah. to the detriment of the taxpayers because we're taking out much more than we can afford to build the, yeah. the new city so hall. So I think that's the part of the game that this process, like all other projects, need to be sold to the public. Yes. And uh, just fleshing up a big number and say, hey, this is what it is. And yeah, I, I recognize that yeah, it's trying to do anything, the prices are going up. Yeah. And uh, if we had another couple of hours, I could go through a bunch of scenarios that I've been following. But at the same time, um, we need to have the details. And yes. I think this is one of the things that I'm looking to you and the rest of the city council to provide in some fashion. Mm-hmm. And uh, surprise, surprise, we've had our half hour of fun. Yeah, we didn't even get to talk about the family dollar lot yet. That's another piece of the puzzle. So I'll have to to come back again soon. Yeah. So I'll take you up on that. Appreciate it. And ladies and gentlemen, thanks for watching us. And uh, this is going to be an interesting season when we start to discuss what comes down from the state on what we can do with our charter and... uh, some of these major capital projects that are due around the city and a lot of issues coming up. So stay tuned and thanks for watching.